All right, well, I'll try this. I had a, a word come into my spirit with a sort of an impact of greater than, than usual. So I'm going to see where this goes. And the word is blood guiltiness. Blood guiltiness. So uh, we had been referring here and there over the previous weeks about Psalm 50. And what, what comes after Psalm 50, uh, I, may, I may refer to that again, but... What comes after Psalm 50 is Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 is the contrite, broken, repentant heart of David when his sin was revealed by Nathan the prophet, you know, when when he was reckoned with, and he became broken and contrite and all of that. And um, that's the reference to the word blood guiltiness. I believe it's only once in the Bible, and it's something that uh, struck me in my spirit as, uh, as the word entered my spirit uh, what impressed me is that this is something we want to keep ourselves from. You know, you can try to do something for the Lord and be wrong in your perception of what the Lord wanted you to do, and you can make mistakes, and you can you know rise up and walk, and then uh, get corrected, and you we we can stumble and falter and do all these things, and uh, there's always grace and there's mercy, but there's something here, there's something here that we want to keep ourselves from. That's a little more serious and has a little more effect on other people, and that God is going to reckon with this stuff. It's blood guiltiness. Blood guiltiness. Where by your words you slay a man. By your words you become a murderer. And God will, you know, whoever sheds man's blood by God, you know, by him, his, his blood will be for the blood shed. And that is a law, a spiritual law. It doesn't mean that we should be the avengers and make that happen, but God will make it happen. It will come to pass. All right, so we don't want to get wrapped up in blood guiltiness. Now, we can uh, do things and say things that slay a man or slay our brother or sister, and we do it in our ignorance, right? Right? then it's, it's like the same distinction we've been making all along about sin and transgression and iniquity and when is sin covered, when is, trans, when is iniquity uh, not imputed. It's when there is no guile and deceit in your spirit. So let, before I even read the scripture in Psalm 51, let me preface it with a little scripture and counsel. From the book of Numbers. About the city of refuge. The city of refuge is the body of Christ. And as you are working out your salvation. And as you are seeking to to the best of your ability. In the judgments of your conscience. What you've attained to so far. And keeping that which you've attained. And yet there may be areas of ignorance. Or areas of, of iniquitous control of your fleshly body. That you haven't got the mastery over yet. And these are issues of sin and transgression and iniquity where they are not deliberated. They're not schemed. There's no guile. There's no deceit. There's no reviling. There's no malice. There's no antagonism. There's no hatred. There's no ill will. There's no intent to maim. Okay? Then then you have a city. We have a city of refuge. And so let me just read the scripture in Numbers 35, starting verse 9. So the Lord speaks unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, When you become over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. Right? At unawares. Didn't mean to, wasn't planning to, wasn't predisposed to. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. And of these cities which you shall give, six cities shall you have for refuge. You shall give three cities on this side, Jordan, three cities shall you give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel, and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, and every one that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. Right? So you sin, and you affect your brother, and it and it hinders his habitation or his, his function, or it sort of kills him, so to speak, kills his life, kills his function, and you didn't meet, meet, need to, what do you do? You run to the throne of mercy. You run to Jesus Christ, the high priest, and your access to him 
is through the body of Christ. Remember, as we said before, you can go to Jesus alone as high priest, but remember the entire body gathered together with the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ is acting on earth to execute the functions of the high priesthood on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is not here, the head of the body. So who executes the judgment? Who judges these situations? Who extends and uh, either retains sins or remits sins? Or who brings the declaration of that retaining of sins or that remission of sins? It's the church. The people in the church do that. They exercise that. So in that sense then, we're, we're in a city of refuge. You know, if any man sin, we have a city of refuge. We have an advocate with the Father, Right? Okay, but what's the, uh, what's the caveat? What's the prerequisite? What's the, uh, it, it's that you have no guile, no deceit, no deliberation, no antagonism, no bitterness. All right, and in these cities you shall flee for refuge and so on. Okay, because when you kill someone, this, this scripture is saying, no matter for what reason you kill a man, knowingly or unknowingly, the avenger of blood's coming after you. He's coming after you. Right? You sow, you reap. But even in, even in the secular world, they have different degrees of indictments for murder, don't they? First degree murder, second degree murder, third degree murder, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the, what I don't know what the degrees mean. I'm, I'm assuming the first degree is the most severe or whatever. You know, schemed, deliberate intentional murder and by the time you get the third degree murder the guy was just trying to defend himself and he accidentally hit the man didn't mean to but he fell and hit his head on the cement block and he died you know that would be less severe right <laughs> sometimes men like that men like that may not even be charged or maybe they'll just get a light sentence of probation and whatever and you'll see so that's the way judgment works Okay, so if any man kills someone, he may flee to the city. If he kills someone unawares, he can flee to the city of refuge. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. In other words, you take a crowbar and you whack the guy. Yeah, you did that pretty deliberately. If he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die and he die, he is a murderer. Murderer shall surely be put to death. Now, how would we interpret that today? Throwing a stone. Casting stones. You know, uh, when they were offended... At the preaching of the word of God and Stephen and other peoples, what did they do? They they stoned him. They stoned him. The holy angels shall bear thee up, lest they dash thy foot against a stone. Well, a stone, stony places, a stone represents sins and the indictment of sin and wrongdoing. So today, if we're casting stones at one another, we're hurling insults, we're hurling indictments, we're hurling, uh, con- condemning firebrands, arrows, and deaths, and we're, he- we're, we're, we're heaping up and we're casting all these arrows, fiery arrows, deliberately, right? You're damned, you're cut off, you're Ichabod, go to hell, those are all stones, thrown, that's all stone throwing. Well, I got a smart aleck answer for anyone who tells me to go to hell now, okay? And here it goes, I mean... If you want to tell me to go to hell, what are you implying? You're implying that I, I am seated in Christ and I have to leave my heavenly heavenly seat in order for me to go to hell. And I'll just say, go to heaven. <laughs> See what I mean? Isn't that a more noble uh, comeback? I would like him to go to heaven. Well, you know, the Bible says, speak evil of no man, don't curse. Do we bless God and curse man who's made in the similitude of God? Do we speak evil of dignity and precedence even though we think we see that they're narcissists and they're selfish and they're, they're this and they're immoral and they're that and they're the other thing? Still, I mean, you can acknowledge that people in positions of carnal worldly power are all those things and they do all those evil things, but you don't speak evil, evil of them, do you? How about Daniel and all those guys? Oh, king, live forever. Heathen kings. We've got to watch it. I mean, we can indict what is sin and what is iniquity. But, you know, we don't want to get into the realm of speaking evil of dignities. And so that's always a, a fine line, isn't it? Well, it is. And I ride that fine line all the time. Well, so throwing a stone. 
If he smite him, throwing a stone wherewith he may die, he, he and, and he die, he is a murderer. Or if he smite him with a hand, weapon of wood wherewith he die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by laying of weight, that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. See, it's a deliberate thing. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, without uh, enmity, being, not being deliberately against him, not deliberately with the intent to strike and smite and malign and injure. And we'll get into the Apostle Paul, who before he was converted, he said, I was a blasphemy and injurious. And he was deliberately injurious because he was blinded exceedingly with a blind religious zeal. But anyway, if he, we'll get back, we'll get to that later. So if he thrust without enemy and have cast upon him anything without laying of weight or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm. And I, I, I've been asserting all along that regardless of how we look at things and speak of things concerning the scenarios that we've been involved with here, about any man out there, Christians, authorities, preachers, what have you, we are doing our diligence that we are speaking the things that concern the necessities that you must acknowledge within the framework of grace uh, that must be acknowledged in order for there to be a restoration. Now, people don't want to acknowledge what I'm saying is necessary for restoration. Well, I did my part. Okay? That, that's why you, you exhort with all long suffering. So if you long suffer, like some of us have for years and years, some of us 10, 15, 20, whatever years, and we've exhorted evil consequences and situations for that long a period of time, then, then that gives you time to fully prove that situation out. And it gives you time to... Fully prove and, and approve your own integrity on the issue before God. And then when you speak, you can speak with boldness. In the face of the contradiction of sinners against your own integrity. Well, I'll go on. So you see, if, if he thrust them... Uh, okay, where am I? Without enmity. Okay? If he neither sought his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood, according to these judgments, and the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he was fled. And he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer at any time come without the border of the city of his re refuge, whether he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge... In other words, you leave fellowship, you leave the body of Christ, you go back to the spirit of the world, you go back to the sin that God supposedly delivered you from, wherever. You're out of your city of refuge. If God delivered you from a sin, and you go back into it, you've, you've left, right? I mean, what the Bible, Bible, we heard so much about talking about the issues of fornication and how you know the, the people want to spiritualize it and, and, and downplay the significance of literal fornication. Well, and the Bible talks about a fornication is talking about literal fornication. That's the preeminent thing it's talking about. The physical fornication. Now you can spiritualize it and that is legitimate. Right? So you can you can legitimately spiritualize it. Okay, now... Um, but if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge. Right. But if you enter back into fornication, physical or spiritual, you enter back into it, to commit fornication, you must leave the body. We've heard that taught. You have to leave the body of Christ and then join yourself to your one with the other. The two shall become one flesh. You have to leave the body of Christ to commit sin or to commit fornication or any sin. <laughs> so this is what it's saying. Then you've left your city of refuge. You understand how the application goes here? All right, so the revenger of blood shall find him. If he, if he leaves the city of refuge, the revenger of blood will find him, and the revenger of blood shall kill the slayer, because, uh, and he shall not... He, hold on. And the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer. 
he shall not be guilty of blood. The revenger of blood who kills the slayer who left the city of refuge shall not be guilty because he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So these things shall be a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations. And that, that's a whole, you could, you could preach a whole message on that, of course. But we're going to cover a, a number of, 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 of issues and principles here. So, blood guiltiness. So, so what is blood guiltiness? The blood guiltiness that's serious is the, is the one where you don't have the city of refuge. There's deceit, there's guile, there's all of that intentional stuff. Now, let's go back to Psalm 51, as I was saying. Here's David lamenting because his sin has been revealed, and uh, he's, seeing, he's feeling the shame and reproach of it. He's broken, he's contrite. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. This is a man who's broken. This is a man who's contrite. Okay? And uh, we've always contrasted that. When we talk about the dispensation of grace and the uh, uh, application of, of forgiveness of sins and the blotting out of uh, transgressions and the not imputing of your in, uh, iniquity uh, to you. Uh, uh, we, and I've often referred to the scripture in Deuteronomy where a man forces a woman, where the man is the devil and the, the woman is the church or the, somebody in the church and si sin oppresses you and, and, and uh, overwhelms you to commit an act. You know, if there's a cry... If there's a cry, then the man shall be put to death, but the woman shall not be put to death, for she cried, and there was no man to save her because she was in the field. And we can go on and on about that, but what I, the, what the, the short to tall of that is, so you sin, and you want to talk about forgiveness and not imputing of iniquity and all of that, well, all, you qual your qualification for all that is when you have no guile and you have the cry. So you sin, and there's the desperate cry, there's the anguish, there's the travail, there's the sorrow. There's the brokenness, there's the contrition, there's the fear, there's the what have I done. You know, contrast that with the common attitude of grace these days where you hear things like, oh, my sins are forgiven before I even commit them. Presuming on the grace. Canceling out the cry. Well, that man is not going to get any of his sins remitted. You have to qualify. Your heart has to come to a state that, that you qualify for the effect of these scriptures to have on your heart. You have to be sorry for your sin. You have to be in a condition where you were striving against sin. Not striving towards it. Striving against sin. It's always right to strive against sin. Oh yeah, but then that's just your own works. Well, so what? Strive against it. Find out it's your own works. And when you fall, at least you tried in your own works, but you fell, and at least the combination of all those things will produce a cry which is the next step. You see what I'm saying? Right? It's just like prayer. Well, I don't know if God will hear my prayer because I'm sinful or I did this. or no. And then you can go back to the Scripture. Not just to Christians, but in general, men ought always to pray. Men ought always to pray. And you would argue, well, Donald, Donald Trump's not a Christian and he's... Uh, not spirit-filled, and he's a this, and he's a that. Well, and but they say he has prayer in the White House every day. That's what I heard. Prayer in the White House every day. Well, good. Le good. You know, the Bible talks about Solomon dedicating the temple. It doesn't just say, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and fast and turn from their wicked way, and if they'll seek my face, uh, you know, if any man shreds his hands in this house and knows his own sore and grief of thy children Israel, and but he goes on to say, or even the stranger which is not of thy people. If they come to this house, if they look towards thy name, because they've heard of the fame and the glory and the power of this house, then even if they come and make petition or request, hear from heaven. You understand there's provision for acts of mercy towards men who may not even be saved. Because it's in the scripture. Because God is good to all. He reigns on the just and on the unjust. 
There's acts of mercy and grace and healing that God distributes to the heathen. If they want to look at the house and invoke the name of Jesus and all that, and they're sincere about it because they've heard of all the mighty power of God, of course, that doesn't go on as much now because the mighty power of God, the expression of that testimony has kind of left the church. The church has lost its savor. The image of God is being hidden by, by the manifestation of sin and transgression and iniquity. Iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold, and God is love, and if there's no love, there's no image of God. There's no sanctification, no holiness, no power. Well, that's what's being restored. Back, back to the point. I'm looking for this scripture. Okay, so then, purge me with hyssop, I'll hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart. No more deceit. No more wrath. No, no more underhanded scheming constantly because I'm going to continue in my sin and try to hide it from everybody. And uh, No, you've got to be in a state where you're trying to depart from sinning. Mm. You've got to be in a state where you've fully embraced Romans 6. And if I yield my members to this, I am the servant of Satan. I can't be the servant of Satan. And as we have been accused for years, we, we put forth these true principles of... Uh, inspiring the church to achieve the holiness of flesh as well as the holiness of spirit, and we're called legalists. Oh, you're just trying to put me under your own law or your own standard. No, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm not doing any of that stuff. So again, I'll plead my integrity on that. So here we go. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You mean there's something happening so severe that it's challenging his confidence of God staying with him? You know, this is a... Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and then sinners shall be converted unto thee. After we have the clean heart, right? Peter, when thou art converted, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Strengthen them. Now, deliver me from blood guiltiness. And you know what David's blood guiltiness was in this, this scenario? Uriah the Hittite. His deliberate scheming just to cover his own behind, if you will. It's very, very deliberate. And it re very much displeased the Lord. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. So, in this place of repentance that David finds after the exposing of a sin the cry of his heart the plea to God what's he acutely aware of in his conscience what's he acutely aware of blood guiltiness and he says God make sure you deliver me from this blood guiltiness I don't want to be guilty of taking another man's life like that like I did with Uriah the Hittite another thing David said is keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion from me then shall I be upright and innocent from the great transgression and what I pray thee is the great transgression we should all know logically just spiritual logic tells you it's the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost it's taking the spiritual things the grace the mercy the forgiveness the dispensation that we're in now the, the dispensation of grace misappropriating misusing abusing, excusing, walking in unholiness, profaning the holiness of God by the misuse of the spiritual riches of mercy and grace, which eventually becomes a transgression against the spirit of grace, which is the Holy Ghost. Because you're presuming on the grace. You're presuming on it. And the grace is not teaching you anything. You understand? Keep me back from presumptuous sins. As soon as you start getting presumptuous about your sin... And when, are you, when do you know you're presumptuous about your sin? Well, when you're cavalier, when you strive towards it, when you make provision for it, when it becomes excessive, when it becomes continuous, when it becomes nonchalant, when it becomes... That's when you're being presumptuous. So, there's some issues here of serious sin, blood guiltiness, and presuming on the things of God. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. What a beautiful thing. No matter what you've done, if you have true brokenness and contrition, and you can touch the heart and throne of God, 
at the throne of mercy and you find the grace and the mercy to help you in the time of need. And then you will receive power and you will receive healing and then you will receive deliverance. You know, whenever anybody sins, you know their soul needs to be healed. And I talk a lot about rejection because I experience a lot of personal rejection and, uh, and I'm not unique to that because every single Christian has to deal with rejection. In fact, every person on the face of the earth needs to deal with it, has to confront it or deal with it or is affected by it in one way, shape or form. Rejection, the feeling like you're alone, the feeling like people are, are against you or don't care about you and all this, this feeling of rejection. Leaving you incomplete, leaving you wanting, leaving you longing, leaving you uh, searching for answers that gives place to malice, it gives place to the want of comfort and every evil vice that there is, rejection. And yet, as Christians, we are walking in the steps. He was despised, he was rejected, he rejected a man. So, now that's another topic, and uh, maybe I'll get back to it sometime eventually, but I used to talk a lot about rejection. It's a fundamental thing. You know, if I am so rejected and I've been so, um, oh, let's see, let's say uh, wounded or traumatized or uh, violated, uh, whether I was actually violated or I just feel like I was violated, whether my perception of, of being violated is true or false, my heart responds as though it's been violated, as though it's been rejected. Through the exercise of being violated and rejected, one can come to cultivate an expectation of rejection all the time. So if I'm always expecting to be rejected, and I count myself to be rejected before I actually am being rejected, well then I'm presuming on the other man's integrity. Right? So if I see a brother come up to me and I'm full of rejection and I'm expecting rejection, now I've talked like this before, you know I've given these examples before. Maybe the brother is busy and he's wrapped up in what he's doing, so I walk by and I say, praise the Lord, brother so-and-so, and he just walks past me. And I'm expecting rejection all the time because that's how my heart has been exercised and it's been wounded. So therefore I think, well, he, well, see, the guy hates me. He doesn't like me at all. S stuck on me. He did, won't, thinks he's better than me. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, maybe and maybe not, right? Maybe he has his own affliction. Oh, maybe he is rejecting me, but not maybe not. You see, you've got to be careful. We have to be careful how we judge things and how we go jump to conclusions. But if anybody is like that, Okay, if I'm full of that rejection, then I, I have the great potential to accuse my brother of rejecting me when he's really not rejecting me. The whole case hasn't been revealed here yet. Now, if I'm full of that rejection, there's something pitiful that needs to be pitiful, and there's a wound in me that needs to be healed, and God needs to deal with my heart. But the tragedy here is that if I'm full of rejection, I have a great potential to slander the integrity of my brother and say he's rejecting me when maybe he isn't. Because when your expectation of something becomes so strong and so vivid in your own mind and spirit that you count it done before it's actually done, then that's a problem. That's a wounded heart, and that, and that is uh, misperceiving the circumstances. So what I'm saying is, anyone who's in that condition, and everyone to a degree is in that condition needs their soul to be healed. Yeah, that's what David said, heal my soul. Well, that, no, well, David said it in other places, but what I'm saying uh, is that, well, let's say that the prayer of Solomon, then I'll forgive their sin and heal their land, heal their hearts. Okay, so what I'm saying is, that from that condition of you feel rejected, like nobody cares about you, nobody wants to hear anything you have to say, if you cultivate that expectation until that's all you can expect, then there may be people out there, they do want to hear what you say, but you've already decided they don't. Yeah. Based on your perverted, over-exercised expectations. So you, you respond according to your expectation of being rejected rather than whether they're actually rejecting you or not. Yeah. Now people can look like they're not listening to a word I say, but hey, if you sow the word, you sow and you plow with the word of God, you plow in hope. You cast your bread upon the many waters, you cast it here, and you cast it here, just in case this may prosper, and if that may prosper, doesn't prosper, maybe the other will prosper, or maybe both alike shall be good. But all I know, all I know right now is, uh, you know, if, if I'm just disillusioned by everybody's sour look, then uh, I, at least I have uh, the reassurance that my word shall not return unto me void. 
It shall accomplish the thing that I sent it for and in the place where I sent it. And if I'm going to plow and preach the word, I better not do it in cynicism. I better do it in hope because hope is faith. I'm doing it by faith. My faith hopes something that happens regardless of the condition of the people, regardless of what I think I see about the condition of the people or the situation. I have to do it in hope. Because if I do it in cynicism, that's not faith. And whatsoever is not a faith, sin. And if I'm doing it out of my own sore, my own rejection, and I, and I begin to uh, strike out at the people I'm preaching at, because I think that they all hate me and they don't want to hear anything, and I do that excessively, what do I become? I become guilty of what? What? Blood guiltiness. So out of our, And that's not just preachers, that's everybody. Your own sore of rejection, expecting, no, nobody wants to help me, nobody, nobody cares about me, no one wants to say good morning, praise the Lord to me. I go through this all the time. I have to fight it I, because I have fight rejection. Okay, so, so then, out of my own sore, I developed the great potential to practice blood guiltiness. You know the scripture in the book of Revelation. For the accuser of the brethren has come down. Yeah, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Revelation 12.10, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So, who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. Now again, we're writing a fine line. We indict the works of evil. We indict the use and the misuse of the things of God and the spirit and the flesh. You can do it with a pure motive, a pure intent, without wishing evil or condemnation on any man. Or you can be, it's like I say, as a minister, you have the right to reprove and rebuke men of authority. But if I'm doing it out of my own sore, reproving and rebuking just becomes striking and brawling. And it becomes excessive. As I said before, um, they hearkened not unto Moses because they hated his guts and they just dreamed up ways that they, they could antagonize him when they lay on their beds at night. No, they hearkened not unto Moses because of anguish of spirit, cruel bondage, the oppression of the age. The people didn't get quite get what Moses was saying, not because they had anything about against Moses, and that's what the Bible says. Moses, I'm sure, had to dwell according to knowledge with the weaker vessels that were before him, just like husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge, as according as unto the weaker vessel, take their weakness into account. Right. Uh, or and from any kind of authority to a lesser person. If someone is, is lesser, you, you condescend to men of low estate. You, you kind of get, go down on their level, right? And as, as we're talking about that, that goes in with peacemakers. This is a little bit of an aside, but it just came into me. When stuff comes into me like that, sometimes I, I feel like i got to say it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Well, if you're going to make peace, you got to come down. How did God make peace? By staying on His high and mighty throne? <laughs> no. He came and he got right down to the same weakness you do. He became a man. Walked in the weakness and likeness of sinful flesh. And related to you on the level of your weakness. And became an equal with you. And from there he can make peace. You want to make peace, you got to come down. you got to come down. I mean, at least for the purpose of making the peace. And as I said before, I mean, God will come down to make peace. But he'll never sacrifice his high and holy place, ultimately. You know that, right? If God comes down to make peace and you you snuff at it or exploit it or scoff at it or mock it, well, he'll jump right back on his throne again and you won't have any peace with God. But what I'm saying is the idea of peacemaking, condescending, consideration of weakness and putting yourself in that mindset and consideration and that's why the whole pattern of God is like that. You know, the head of Christ is God and you know, the head of man is Christ, and you know, so to, to Christ, the man is, is weak and feeble and needy, right? So then, because of that, the man should be able to say, well, then that's the way my wife is to me. She's weak and feeble and needy, so I can be long-suffering, I can do this, I can do that, and whatever. And then likewise, the, uh, the, and the, the other way, you know, wives, submit yourself to your husbands and everything, and you can work your way back up. There's both sides of that issue. I'm really getting spread out here. I'm going to try to rein this in. Uh, 
the whole thing I was trying to get is, is, is the word blood guiltiness. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Blood guiltiness, that which sheds blood and causes death by man or animal. Bloodshed, drops of blood. The guiltiness of taking another life. And we know that uh, that's done with the sword. The sword is not a physical sword. It's words of mouth. That's done by you know, stoning a man, and that stone is not a physical stone. It's, it's, it's hurling the accusation, hurling the insult, insult the, the cursing, the firebrands, the arrows, the death. As we said, even, if, even for the unsaved, we've got to be careful how we talk about it. Do we bless God and curse man who's made in the similitude of God? And even with man, you always have to look at man, unsaved man, like uh, from the perspective that, okay, they are not in the body of Christ. They are not subject to the law of God. They are subject to their fears and their bondages. Why should I expect, even expect them you know, to conduct themselves in the law of, of God and the law of charity towards me? Why should I even expect it? I have a particular problem with that, or I've had a particular problem with that, uh, with the hotel owners and things like that, you know, what do I expect? How do I expect their contract towards me? You know, I mean, it, it, you look at the irony. There's some irony I, I, ironies in there. I mean, I might do a job, and some guys might take three months or four months to pay me, and then when I finally get around to it, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Donut, and I forgot. You know. So I just say, well, what if I say to that guy, okay, I'll, you know, I'll change your 40 toilets. Give me two thousand dollars up front. And what if I went away for three months? And, Jonathan, you never did my toilets. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> what, how would they feel, right? Yeah. And yet I did their work. I supplied the toilet seals. I did all the toilets. The work's already done. I gave them the invoice. What responsibility should be on me after that? Nothing. They should get me the check and call me up and say, okay, Jonathan, your check is ready. And actually there are some of my customers that actually do that. Well, some don't. They just don't care. So I'll get mad and say, this guy don't give a hoot about me and what's what, 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 wrong with them. And you, know, you go home at night and say, well, no, nope, that's the way they are. That's the way it's going to be. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to chase my money down. And to give them the benefit of the doubt, yeah, it's, it's not that they are scheming and saying, aha, let's see if we can cheat Jonathan out of his money. It's not like that. But it is iniquity. They're so wrapped up in their own lives, they don't care about the other guy that much. To make sure he gets paid what he's already done. It's not, it's not all that important to him. All right. Anyway, Cain talks with Abel's brother, and it comes to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and slew him. And, you know, back uh, out in the New Testament, First John. And why did Cain slew Abel? Because Abel's, Cain's deeds were evil and Abel's deeds were righteous. Okay, and the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground, from the heart. Okay, so when I'm, my integrity is slandered and so on and so forth, and it grieves me and it wounds me, kills my function, kills my role, what have, what have you, my heart cries. That's the ground. My ground is my heart. And the cry of my shed blood comes up before God. If you're suffering for righteousness' sake, you know we heard uh, we used to hear preachers who taking shots at other people and say, "Well, where are you, brother so and so? Where are you? Where are you?" And it was as if he was saying, uh, "Where are you now?" Like when when God said to Adam, "Where are you, Adam? Where are you?" Implying that wherever you are, you're not in your place. Because when God cried for Adam, where are you? It's because Adam wasn't in his place. Well, I had a man say that about me the other day. And unfortunately for him, it came the day after I had a personal visitation from the Holy Ghost. And one of the things, and now you can say I'm just making this up. Or you can say maybe the devil is telling me these things, if you like. But then if it's not the devil and it's the Holy Ghost, now it's getting tricky because you're almost calling the Holy Ghost the devil. So yeah. if you want to start flirting with the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and challenge my integrity, uh, I wouldn't advise it. But this has happened to me too many times for it to be the devil. And one of the things God told, tells me is, uh, yeah, I'm presently walking according to what I've attained and, uh, and my steps are ordered by God. Don't worry, your steps have been ordered. So 
So the scripture that says, Adam, where are you? It doesn't apply to me right now in this season I'm in. It doesn't apply to me. So say what you want. But what the irony, I'm getting to an irony here. Well, here's another where are you. Here's another where are you. Or uh, actually, as the Lord says to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Where is Abel? You know, God says to Adam, where are you? But to Cain, he says, where is Jonathan? Where is Chris? Where is this one? Where is that one? Because I hear blood crying to me from the ground. Grieving. I hear grieving. See, so there's another question. Where is somebody? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Well, what is that? That's blood guiltiness. That's what I've been saying all along. Slander. Psalm 50. You slander your own mother's son. Genesis 9, 5, and 6, just a basic principle. Surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. There's the uh, framework of a spiritual law. It doesn't say brother there, it just says man. What shall we do, he said to John the Baptist? Do violence to... No man. How about Proverbs chapter 1, starting verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. They shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and hold as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot amongst us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed innocent blood. Their feet make haste. Rash with their mouth. Accusation under their tongue. Bitter words. Like a sharp razor. Uh, a cutting remark of condemnation and cut off. Of, of implying you have no stat status with God when you do. What shall be given unto thee, O deceitful tongue? Thou, thy tongue worketh deceit like a sharp razor. Cutting razor blade. Well, we're talking about blood guiltiness. Rash with your mouth. Swift to shed innocent blood. And what was the uh, sin of King Manasseh? From one end of Jerusalem to the other, what did he do? What did he do? He shed innocent blood. Quick, rash judgments. Not followed through on. Not fully sought out. Accusations. That's what it was. It's not that he killed them all with a sword, or whether he did or he didn't. Our application is that it's slanders. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They look privily for their own lives. Now we reiterate again, the cause and effect of, uh, of blood guiltiness when it's done in evil and in rashness and all of these deceitful and guileful things. And Well, what is it? It's, it's an evil thing. It's a wicked, wicked thing. And the wicked fall by their own counsel. So what are they doing? They're laying wait for their own blood. As I said before, you see that in the counsel of the unrighteous. Remember, Haman hang on his own gallows. Saul fell on his own sword. The things that the Holy Ghost brings to an unrighteous man that are in his own indictments. The unrighteous man will turn and accuse everybody else of the things that are his indictments. So whatever he tries to, you know, well, there's another scripture that says they, they cast iniquity upon the people. They try to cast it on them. Iniquity that doesn't belong to them. Iniquity that they're not practicing. Now I know there's areas I'm probably in my iniquity and everything else. But there's certain areas of iniquity that someone will accuse you of that you are not practicing. Casting iniquity. Well, and then we get to the scriptures of Ezekiel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, to remind you, blood guiltiness, blood guiltiness. Let, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go to blood guiltiness. Again, I hope we understand the difference between uh, 
the provocation that compels one to defend their integrity and the integrity of their brethren, that is not blood guiltiness. This is the description and indictment of evil works that are in the church. Okay, i got some more to say. Son of man, will thou judge, will thou judge the bloody city? Thou shalt show her all her abominations. Thus saith the Lord, the city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come and make it idols against herself to defile itself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed. Thou hast defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made, and hast, thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and are come even unto thy years. Therefore I have made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. Is that the state of the church? So this is a prevailing thing in the whole church, mind you. you know, I'm not just limiting it to an individual or anything. But I know how it, how it applies to some individuals. Okay, I know how it applies to myself, believe it or not. And with me, the way I see it the most of myself is when I'm in my wounds, in my rejection. I'm expecting evil. Then you become cynical. I, I, I know a man that uh, he was in poverty in his spirit and everything else. And if he wanted help, you know, he could say, if you wanted help with something, you could say, hey, brother, can you help me uh, wire this house? Hey, brother, can you help me on this paint job? But the way this guy would always say it, he'd always go, well, I suppose you don't want to help me uh, do some painting today. <laughs> so actually he wants help, and he's asking for help, but you can see the state of the heart and the abundance of the heart is manifesting that he is expecting not to get help. Yeah, well, that's a soul that needs healing. Yeah. And that's, that's someone who's probably let down a lot in his life. But people probably let him down a lot in life, right? And he needs to be healed. Well, that, that's an example. Thou art become guilty in the blood that thou hast shed. Hast defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made. Those, those that be near and those that be far from thee shall mock thee, which are infamous and much vexed. Behold, the princes of Israel, every one were in thee to their power to shed blood. Now we're getting back to the princes of the land. There's power in them to shed blood. See, be not many masters. Why? Because the masters are bringing indictments. And if it's out of their own sword, it's just putting forth the finger. They're running the fine line of indicting the church or, or, or walking in blood guiltiness. Because so, so, it's in the power of a prince to indict or to, or to go off in his own sword and become a partaker of blood guiltiness. There's another scripture in Ezekiel said, you, you, you stand upon your sword. In other words, you shed innocent blood, you're using your sword, your authority, your power that God gives you to stand, to stand in an evil thing, to stand in an evil status, a continuation of evil. And you're using your sword to do it. The princes of Israel, everyone were in thee to, to their power to shed blood. In thee they have they set light by father and mother. In thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised my holy things, profane my Sabbath. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood. Carry what? Tales. Accusations. Now, I've had accusations come, come against me about particular things. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want to go down there. But what I, uh, there's something I said, Lord, who would tell someone such a thing about me like that? And you know, Lord, I haven't done anything like that in about 30 years, 40 years. And so I said, Lord, it, it may not be any of my business, and if, it, I don't, if it's danger, dangerous for me to know how it happened, I'll, 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 I'll try to submit to that. But I'd like to know, what happened? Who did this? How did this come out? Well, the other day I was visiting a brother I hadn't seen in a long, long time, and I did not solicit anything from him. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, Jonathan, when we were uh, sitting around with the brothers one day, yeah, this particular brother used to say all this stuff about you and you and uh, how you did such and such a thing uh, since you left, and, uh, and, I, and then that was exactly what I was seeking. That was the revelation, that that's the man who started the slander. And he started the slander. Okay, so it, it's not the truth, it's a tale. Don't carry a tale with you to shed innocent blood. Don't draw a conclusion about a brother prematurely about what his intent is, whether he is sinning against you or rejecting you or not rejecting you. Uh, don't do it before you have sought it out. You know, the Bible gives provisions for judgments. Like, you know, if a man sins and da 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 and the sin comes to the attention, then all the judges shall make diligent search. They'll make diligent search to see, is it like it's been reported or not? And we have to do that. You get a thought about your brother in your mind, you better search it out. 
Because if the thought is an accusation and it's a tale and you believe it and you re- react to it according to believing it, then you're, you're carrying a tale to shed innocent blood. Lord, deliver me from blood guiltiness. I don't want to be the cause of the death of another man. Yeah, if I have my own little struggles with this or that and I can't stop smoking and I had a cigarette, and one, that's one thing. But if I'm starting to carry a tale that murders my brother, whoa, Lord, keep me from blood guiltiness. Right? It's a different magnitude. One that committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, another lewdly defied his daughter in law, and thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter, and thee they have taken gifts to shed blood. Right? They receive flattery and honor from other people, gifts, gifts of honor. To shed blood and accuse somebody else. Thou hast taken usury and increase, thou hast greedily gained off thy neighbors by extortion, as it has forgotten me, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I have smitten mine, I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made, and at thy blood which thou hast been in the midst of thee. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? See, I'm just showing you God's reaction to blood guiltiness. It gets him all, ris- all riled up. Blood guiltiness. I'll scatter you among the heathens, disperse thee in the countries, and thou shalt take thy inheritance in the sight of the heathen. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the whole house of Israel to me is dross. They're brass and tin and iron and lead. In the midst of the furnace, they're like the dross of silver. Thus saith the Lord God, because you're all become dross, therefore I'll gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, and I'll gather the silver, the brass, the iron, the lead, and the tin in the midst of the furnace, blow the fire to melt you. In my anger and my fury, I'll leave you there and melt you. You see, and the land is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of his indignation. There's a conspiracy of of her prophets in the midst, like a roaring lion. They've devoured souls, taken the treasure, made many widows. The priests have violated my law, profaned my holy things. Put no difference between the holy and profane. On you go. And her prophets had daubed them with untempered mortar. That's Ezekiel 22, 28. Referencing daubing the building with untempered mortar. Ezekiel 13 uh, echoes the same issue about the wall that they built, walls of holiness, it shall come down, it will crumble down, because you daubed it with untempered mortar. You did not strengthen this wall, stone upon stone, brick upon brick, it's held together with the mortar. The, the true mortar is the true love of God. It's the true mortar. And if you keep your people together with anything other than the true love of God, what's going to happen? You're going to have a church like a revolving door. People are going to come in, and then they're going to come out. Then a new crop of people are going to come in and a new crop of people are going to go out. Why? Because nothing can hold it together. How come nothing can hold it together? Because it's daubed with untempered mortar. It's not the true counsel of God according to godliness, holiness, righteousness, the proper use of grace and mercy. So it doesn't ever hold together. It's like I said, if the last church age was the church of Philadelphia, the church of the open door, I'd like to call this Church age, the church of the revolving door. Yeah. Because everyone seems to come in and the door revolves and then they go back out. Well, shouldn't, shouldn't something hold together what God has joined together? Whether it's a marriage or a business venture or a group of people. Let not man put asunder. So something's not right in the doctrine. Something's not right in the council because it can never hold together. And then Ezekiel 33. Now, Ezekiel 33 is, you know, Son of man, I set thee a watchman, hear the word of my mouth, and warn them from me. And then at the end of the Ezekiel 33, we used to hear this a lot, uh, you know, uh, Son of man, the children of thy people are still talking in the walls against thee, and then they'll know that a prophet has been among them. Well, so I, I, I'm i looking a little ahead, uh, in front of that in Ezekiel 33. Starting verse 23, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they didn't have it, those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land has given us for inheritance. Wherefore you say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You eat with the blood, you lift up your eyes towards your idols, and you shed blood. And shall you possess the land? Everybody see what's, what's developing here? Every single time God has finally had it with his people, and sends the prophet to bring this grave indictment about the state of the ter- church, and the practice of their abominations, and the declaration of God that he's going to melt them, and he's going to deal with this, and he's rising up in his anger. Every time there's an issue of blood guiltiness. Every time. 
That, I'm, I'm emphasizing blood guiltiness. And that's the word that came into my spirit all week. Blood guiltiness. Blood guiltiness. Blood guiltiness. It's not a little thing. You eat, okay? You shed blood. Shall you possess the land? You want to shed blood? You want to eat, eat with uh, blood and lift up your eyes to your idols? You stand upon your sword. That's what I was saying earlier. You stand upon your sword. What are you standing on? You're standing in your present evil practice and you're using your sword as a defensiveness to, to ward off anyone who challenges your evil lifestyle. You're protecting your evil lifestyle and you're using the sword of God to do it. You're standing. What are you standing? What are you standing on? Not standing on faith. Not standing on the truth. You're standing in your evil thing and you're using your sword. See? This is an indictment. This is an indictment of Ezekiel. You stand upon your sword and you work abomination. See? So standing on your sword there is not a righteous thing. Not like using your sword within the armor of God like Ephesians 5. You stand upon your sword, you work abomination, you defile everyone as neighbor's wife, and shall you possess the land? Shall you be saved? Shall you go on in good standing with God? Say now thus unto them, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely they that are in the way shall fall by the sword. And this is the pronunciation of judgment. Him in the open field I'll give to the beast to be devoured. Well, you know, you can always go back to Jeremiah. At what instant I shall speak evil concerning a nation or a people, if they'll turn from their evil. God can still turn. But this is what God's doing. This is how his wrath gets stirred. And he goes on, Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations. Romans 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. What shall be given unto thee, O deceitful tongue? Yep. The poison of asps is under the lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Yeah. Go to hell. Damn all of you. What the hell? Get out of here. Get everybody out. Well, there, there might be a time and place for that. But if there's an excess of it and that's all you hear, we have a problem. It's a mouth of cursing. It's a deceitful tongue. It's done with intent to strike and injure and maim. And that's what Paul did when he was not converted. I will read that. There, Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed swift to shed, shed blood. blood. Deceitful tongue, the old tongue, the world of iniquity, the unruly member, the thing you got to watch more than anything else, the tongue, the tongue, the tongue. Words, huh? Words, words. What are words? Words are spirit. Words are life. Words are a sword. If I have a very, very skillful use of, of words, I can use a very sharp sword to make an incision, like a surgical incision. And if your knife is really sharp, you can make the cut and a person can hardly feel the pain. And get, get the infection out of there and it can heal up, right? But if your sword is not sharp, then what does it do? It just rips up the flesh, leaves lots of occasion for inf more infections to come and it tears things up and leaves a lot of damage. Well, you don't want to be quick with that stuff. Let every man be slow to speak, slow to wrath. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction, misery, and other ways. The, peace, the way of peace they have not known, there's no fear of God before their eyes. And in Psalm 52, which is after Psalm 51, is the one about the tongue. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and you love lying rather than to speak righteousness. What a state to be in, huh? You'd rather embrace the lie, utter the slander, kill your brother, and call him the evil one. It's deceitful. It's like a sharp razor slicing people up. Not, don't even know. You haven't even vetted it out. Don't even know what you're talking about. Thou lovest all devouring words. Deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. Take thee away. We're relating this to blood guiltiness, right? How far down the path of blood guiltiness do we want to go? He'll pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. The righteous shall also see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God a strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Remember, standing upon your sword. Strengthening yourself in your wickedness. Using your sword to ward off all uh, 
to, to drive back all indictments and pleas against your evil so that you can just stay in your status quo. All right, the accuser. I read this already. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. That word accuser means to complain at law against one in the assembly. All right, so are you in making an indictment? Or are you just complaining about the state of your brother? Good question to ask, right? You're just complaining? Is that all you expect? Is that all you talk about? You know, how sour your brother is? How much he irks you? Wishes God would just get rid of him? Get him all out of here? All that stuff? All right, complainant at law. That is what the accuser is. All right, now here's an interesting application of something we've heard. Now, I'm the Lord who declares the end from the beginning. Well, what happened at the beginning of the Gentile church age as Jesus Christ brought in the age of the Gentiles? Just before Paul was struck down the road to Damascus, the church was all ready and the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost and uh, the church had begun. And, the, and so that was the beginning of the age of grace. Well, what was declared at the beginning? We have, we have Paul the Apostle persecuting the church. So I'll read the references. Acts 26, 9 through 11. Paul, I think is it King Agrippa, is it? I think he's talking to Festus or Agrippa or that season where he was dealing with both of those men. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Right? So when I'm in a ministry and I die in that ministry and I can't do anything more, I'm, I die because I've been slandered and no one believes that I'm a teacher anymore and I die. And they put forth their voice against me or, or any of you. And I gave my voice against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. What? With what? With a whip? With a chain? With tongue lashings? With complaints? With insults? With what? With beratings? Take your pick. And I compelled them to blaspheme. So provoking was it. He was so provoking that it compelled the people to blaspheme. That would be like the mild-mannered kid at school. And the bully comes and keeps taunting him and pushing him and shoving him and sticking an elbow in his armpits. And the poor kid is mild-mannered and he keeps trying to ignore it and trying to ignore it. In fact, and, until he's so provoked that the little kid who's not even prone to be violent, turns around and clocks the bully right in the mouth because he just was pushed over the edge. As I said before, this is an age of provocation. This is a provoca provocative, not just in the sense of, you know, you usually hear the word provocative in, in terms of enticement sexually and that kind of thing, but anything that provokes you or tries to bring something out of you, an emotion and an action and a deed that you don't normally do because you've been provoked, you've been pushed, you've been compelled, you've been provoked. I've talked about provo provocation in every, every way, right? The children of God provoked God and Moses. And then fathers, provoke not your children. Authorities, provoke not the saints. The, the warning goes throughout the body of Christ. The provocation is excessive. That's one of the reasons why men despise dominion. Dominion have become perverse and provocative. And there's other things you might argue, well, that's because the people are perverse. And you can go on and on and on about that stuff. But I'm just telling you, the state of things is the way it is. Provocation doesn't just come from the lesser vessels. It can come from the greater vessels. That's why the Bible addresses the issue on both fronts. So I compelled them to blasphemy and being exceedingly mad against them. Always mad against them. Always complaining. Always an issue with them. Constantly. Always mad at them. That I, I persecuted them unto strange cities. Well, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen amongst us, among myself and among, uh, among you. Compelled and provoked to depart from a place and come to a strange circumstance where it's like we've left the fellowship of Christians and we're not allowed there anymore and we're being slandered and yet we're not... We're not. Uh, we can't go back to the to the denominational churches, and we can't fully give ourselves to them because we know that's Babylon, mother of harlots. And we can't really go out into the world because we're Christians, and we kind of been left stranded now. 
And so here we are in this little isolated, lame fellowship of Christians, but still trying to function and keep our souls alive in the time of famine. It's a strange city, isn't it? It's a strange city. We're persecuted to this condition, to this strange city. And that's the application of that. Scripture. That's what Paul did. Oh, so God is declaring the end from the beginning. This is what Paul did in the beginning of the church age. Is this what authorities will now be doing at the end of the age of grace? Declaring the end from the beginning? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So you've heard of my conversation, Paul says in Galatians. You've heard of my conversation, my lifestyle, in times past in the Jews' religions. How that, beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And Paul says somewhere else, who before was a blasphemer and injurious. So what, what does that mean? Well, he was doing wrong to the members of the body of Christ. When he was in that unconverted state, in his sin, he, he, had no, he, he, he couldn't stand up in any confidence and say, I have wronged no man. Paul couldn't say that until after he learned to love the church. So until you learn to love the church, stop beating brains out everybody. Well, you can't say I've wronged no man. Paul wronged plenty of people here in his unconverted state. So, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And that brings me to the next most important scripture here. It's the parable of the unjust steward. And he said unto his disciples, Luke 16, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Now, let a man so account of us, Paul says, as ministers, apostles, and so forth, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the church of God. Moreover, it is required in a man that is a steward that he be found to be faithful. And isn't that something, because Luke 16 is going gonna, is gonna to address the same faithfulness issue. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. He that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. God tries us in the, the, the vanity of the things of this world first to see how our faithfulness plays out on the things that really don't matter ultimately so we can practice and cultivate our faithfulness upon things that are not as important so that if we slip up and we make our mistakes, the consequences are upon the vanity instead of the consequences being upon the spiritual and our brother and our sister. Right? How can a man love God who he has not seen if he can't love his brother who he has seen? How can a man say, I am faithful to the spiritual things of God that he doesn't see if he can't be faithful to his brother, faithful to his daughter, faithful to his wife who he does see? You're unfaithful in the least. You're unfaithful in the least. You're unfaithful. Well, that's just a principle. I'm sure I could take that principle and in some way, shape, or form bring indictment against every one of us. And God gives grace. But I, you know, if, if, if I'm not being faithful, it's not, not a good thing for me to try to fool myself and everybody else to, th to s declare that I am. Yeah. Then what, I, what do I do then? I make myself a false witness and a false swearer. And God will come and bring swiftly and bring up and I'll be a swift witness against the false swearer and the uh, adulterer and the whatever and the... I'll be a swift witness against the false swearer. All right, so let's go back. A certain man has a steward, a rich man. That's, that's the Lord, okay? He has a steward. That's someone who is a steward, placed in authority, has a, a mysteries of God. And the same was accused that he had what? Wasted God's goods. Wasted the rich man's goods. Who are the God's goods? We're God's goods. We're God's vessels. We're the goods. Paul said, I persecuted the church of God and wasted, wasted it. Can we see the correlation of the words and the patterns? And he called him and said unto him, How is this that I hear of thee? Give account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Wow, he's going to be put out of stewardship? A threat of losing ministry or failing to fulfill something? That's pretty grave, right? And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? The Lord takes away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. Well, this is a man who's coming to the, to the end of things. Folks, we are at the end of this. We don't have time to go back to the beginning and start all afresh like we did exactly at the beginning and to dig. We're, we're, we're well along into the momentum of this thing. right? To beg, I am ashamed. Well, the steward had been so long in the position of 
authority and honor and everything else, his heart just couldn't take the, the, the demotion of going back to being a beggar. That was just too big a hit on his heart. To beg, I'm ashamed. I cannot dig. What am I going to do? You know, the wheels of ministry are turning. The wheels of the end of the age of grace is turning. It's turning and it's proceeding. I can't go back and start over. You see, you see what he's saying? What am I going to do? He said, oh, I'm resolved of what, I, what I'll do when I'm put out of the stewardship that they may receive me into their houses. So he called everyone as Lord's debtors unto him and said, How much owest thou unto my Lord? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said, Take thy bell, sit down quickly, and write fifty. And he said to another, How much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto them, Take thy bill and quickly write fourscore less. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And I like to spiritualize this because, I like to spiritualize it. The mammon of unrighteousness. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have the mammon or the riches of God, the mammon, but it's in the unrighteousness of our sinful flesh, which we must then sanctify that flesh so that the riches can come out. All right. The reason I say that is because make yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into what? Everlasting habitations. So inevitably we all fail, right? Inevitably we all fall somewhere along the line. And when I fail, well, this gets into a couple of things. One is, the steward says, what am I going to do? How much do you owe your Lord's debtors? Seems like everybody had a perception of what they owed the Lord. And it was a whole bunch. And the steward finally says, Listen, I've been at you, at, I've been pretty hard at you, and I've been at you all the time, saying a hundred measures of wheat, a hundred measures of wheat, a hundred measures of wheat. What's wrong with you? Give me a hundred measures of wheat. Now the steward's in trouble. Well, says, Listen, just, just make it 50. 50 is good enough. Lower the bar. Drop the standards. Drop what you are trying to extract and exact as far as response from your brother. Drop the bar. See? Drop the bar. Drop the standard a little bit. Not entirely. Not entirely. There's still things required. Yeah, according to what you're able to. You understand? It's changing your mindset towards the people. You know, if I just rail at everybody and accuse them of hating me and, and uh, hating, every, hating me and not, never want to hear anything I say and bring a whole bunch of charges against them and you're disgusting, wicked people... That's like in the, that, that's a pretty high charge. That's a hundred measures a week. But I say, listen, okay, now I get get it. That sometimes it's not not that you're so much ag against me as much as I think you're against me. Uh, it's actually sometimes you're just oppressed. It's the it's the age of oppression, and you're not able to hearken unto me for anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. So just give me fifty percent of your attention. Just give me fifty percent of a good look on your face. Lower your bar. Lower your expectation of your brother. Lower it. Lower it. You've got to lower it. You can't exact all that stuff out of the people of God. Hophni and Phinehas and the priests in his days couldn't do it. Well, they tried to, right? They actually did. Give us flesh to eat. Give us flesh. Give us response. Give us obedience. Give us this. Give us this. hundred measures a week. You know. And the people said, well, just wait till we boil it. And like the, like the law says, until it's properly prepared, and you can have as much as you want. No, no, no. Give it to me right now. Give it to me now. If you don't give it to me, I'm going to force the issue. I'm just going to keep on you day and night, hour after hour, stripe after stripe, until you give me what I want. The obedience, the hug, the look on your face, whatever it is. Oh, that was a great, great sin. Those guys got put to death for that. Yeah. that, that, that and, and, and the sin became so grievous that men didn't like <laughs> they abhorred the offering of the Lord then because they're greeted with this oppression from the priest trying to force the flesh give us the flesh give us the flesh to eat that's like saying give us obedience give us response give us this well just wait until God deals with our hearts and we go through the operation of God and, and we get you know gradually transformed by the renewing of our minds and then we'd be more than willing to lay down our lives for you and this is the thing that's really grievous about all this stuff if people lay down their lives for another minister, another man of God, for 10, 20, 30, whatever years, like like I know I have, and I've proven this before God, and I know others have too, we've done it, brother. Some of us have actually done it. We've actually did what we did by charity. 
and then got cast off. Well, you read about the Bible. I may read it now, Psalm 109. What does the, what does the uh, Bible say that, that is the consequences of rewarding evil for charity? I know I gave my diligence to try to lay down my life, and I gave the best years of my life. They're actually the best years of my life. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I did. And I submitted, and I, I gave long-suffering and charity. I took it as, just as far as I could take it. I take it to the uttermost end that I could take it. You understand? It took, it took a guy like me from the time I caught wind that things were not quite what I thought they should be in, uh, amongst a group of Christians and then taking another seven or eight years to finally get to the place where <laughs> I could no longer be a partaker of evil. And then I had to obey what the gospel says is have no fellowship you know, from such withdraw thyself it took me a long time so I didn't do that on a win and most of us didn't but you see what the unjust steward has to do here he has to lower the standard lower the expectation lower the expectation this is when I, I always talk about expectation a lot don't I what do you you know what did you go out in the wilderness to see for instance if you're talking about men of God yeah men of God have authority and they have austerity and they're not going to be nice guys generally so you got to you got to remember that. What did you, and then, but then, what 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 are you expecting from your brother and your sister? Like, what do I expect from the be response of the heathen who don't even have the Holy Ghost? What what are the ministers expecting from their flock who are weaker vessels and they're oppressed and they're overwhelmed? And the, what what are you expecting from them? A hundred measures of wheat. You better strike that off and say, okay, look, just give me fifty, and that'll be good enough. So what are you expecting from your brother? Expect less. For the purpose of making peace and getting right with God. Expect what is realistic. Let's put it that way. Do not exact. You know, Ezekiel said, remove your exactions from your pe- from my people. You have an exact expectation of how this should go. And it doesn't meet your exact expectation. And then there's nothing but indictment against the other for it. No, this is not right. All right. So I say to yourself, make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And here's my point here. If I were to make friends with the heathen, right, so that when I fail, they may receive me, well, if they're heathen and they're not saved, they're not going to receive me into an everlasting habitation. That's why I believe this scripture is, is talking about within the church. The mammon of unrighteousness, the mammon means the riches. The riches is the riches of Christ, but it's in the mammon, this, the, the, the sinful flesh, the unrighteous, it's the right? It's in the earthen vessel. So when I fail, you can minister mercy, grace, and peace to me, and, and we, you can support me with charity and nurture me back to spiritual help, and you will receive me into an everlasting habitation. I will be everlasting in Brother Chris's heart. Everlasting I'll be in his heart. Because, you know, he showed me the kindness and whatever. He ministered to my need and supported me and let me... Uh, you know, live amongst the saints and put up with my junk while I was working out my own bitterness and whatever. You see what I'm saying? It cultivates, we receive each other into an everlasting place in each other's hearts. Everlasting habitation. So then, he that is faithful in that which is least also is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? You see what I'm saying here? I think you understand. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found. The number one requirement in stewardships is faithfulness. Don't say you're unfaithful for your, to your wife for 20 years and say, but I'm faithful to God. Because you're not. There's, there's ways I'm not, I'm, I'm not faithful to God and I've got to work it out. Right? I'm just saying. <laughs> just, don't, just acknowledge it. Don't make the boast when you're not. Because the scripture is very plain. It's very plain. You've got to get the faithfulness right on the things that are in the vanity of this world, the things you see, the things that you do in life. You've got to practice it on that and get it perfected, and then you take it into the spiritual realm. If you haven't done that in, in your own realm of what's in this life, who's going to trust you with the riches of God? That's why Psalm 50 says, Who art thou to take my word in your mouth? Seeing you cast this, my words behind me, behind you, and you refuse instruction and all of that. If you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can turn 
serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and the riches of this life, or the riches of getting pleasure from this life, or the riches of money in this life. You cannot. No man can serve two masters. You either hate the iniquity and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or you love your sin and your iniquity and you despise anyone. You despise and slander anyone who threatens your position in, in your sin. You cannot serve God and sodomy. And that's what God calls His own church, Sodom and Gomorrah. He also, that's what He calls the world. When the church has too much world in it, Isaiah says, give ear, you rulers of Sodom, you inhabitants of Gomorrah. That's God talking to his own people. Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. crucified. Well, he's crucified in the world. We're in Jerusalem. You can't, you can't be a Jesus Christ and a Sodomite. You can't serve two masters. Now, Psalm 59, for the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips. The sin of their what? Mouth. Let, the lips. Let, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let, let them know that God ruleth in, uh, in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. And at evening let them return and make a noise like a dog. And go around about the city and let them wander up and down for meat. And let them grudge if they're not satisfied. Like a man who is looking for something and his standard of what he's looking for from the people is way too high. His expectation is completely unrealistic. It's based on the sore of his own heart. And he wanders around always looking for something from people. And he's never going to get it. And constantly grudging and never satisfied with the situation. Well, that's the evil man doing that. A man that doeth violence to the blood of any person. A man who violently maligns in such a way to uh, upset the life of, of what a man does. Like my life is to be a teacher, right? People speak in such a way to, to convince others I'm a false teacher and people don't want anything to do with me. And I, I encounter that to this day. I go to Walsh where I see people that I used to know in other Christian fellowships and they've been told I'm an evil man and they, they run away from me. As soon as I see them, they run away. Okay, well, there's been a violent act being done to my life here as a teacher. Now, fortunately, if someone tries to kill my role as a teacher... Fortunately, I have faith in the resurrection from the dead. It's like I said, I believe, you know, I, you might cast me out and I might die as a teacher and I might fail to function as a teacher for a season because whatever. But eventually, God will raise me from the dead. He'll transplant me into another Christian garden, another Christian field, another Christian context of people. And away I go, I'll be resurrected and I'll be teaching again. And how, how, how did God justify Jesus? How is our justification? Because He raised Him from the dead. Raised again for our justification. So here I am, I'm still teaching. I'm still preaching. I still have the manifestation of the authority of the Holy Ghost. And the liberty and the power and the anointing of God. That's my resurrection. That's God justifying me. And filling me with comprehensive soundness of doctrine. If I dare say it, so, I'm, I'm just saying it to you. If you want to listen long enough, you'll hear it. It covers a lot of angles. It's, I'm just saying because I, I'm, as I go, I, I get to understand how the teacher calling works and what it does. All right, so finally, Psalm 109. The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. Remember, blood guiltiness, blood guiltiness. If, we, if any of us are guilty of blood guiltiness, and we have been, and we may be again, like maybe it'll be unintentional, maybe it'll be intentional, hopefully it's unintended, you have a city of refuge, you can work things out, all of that. Now let me say something, one other thing too. You may have an accusation against your brother, and you think your brother is doing something sort of snide and underhanded, and you're not sure, and uh, your heart begins to become convinced of it, because you, you think it, it's, a, it's a pretty good case, but you hold back. You say, well, it seems like such and such, and you may even start feeling a little bad about it, but you hold back, and you try to wait, and you try to seek it out. And this is, that's the proper way to deal with that kind of stuff. Because then at least the work of uh, accusation doesn't get a full foothold on you. you, you at least it doesn't get the full root in you. And if you find out something otherwise, you're still able to let let go of the charge. 
right? That's like the high priest who sees a spot on a man, a spot of leprosy, and say, okay, well, here's a spot of leprosy, and the high priest brings him in ward, and he examines the man, and if the spot is only surface skin deep, and it, it doesn't spread throughout the body and so forth, and he can, okay, we'll pronounce this man clean. So you can have a brother, he feels starting to feel ill about the other brother because he thinks the other brother is doing something to him that the other brother may or may not be doing. We don't know yet, but he starts to feel ill. That's, that's like sin and the accusation trying to rise up in you and there's a manifestation that you're questioning the integrity of your brother. Well, that's the beginning of a, a spot of leprosy. But that doesn't mean you're guilty yet. Let's take him in reward, take it to the high priest, let the high priest examine you, let's bring counsel, judgment, doctrine, revelation, let's illuminate the issue, find out what's going on, and if you can let go of the issue, you're, you're, you're clean. No sin. Right? But if you keep it and it starts to fret inward and get into your heart, then, then, you, then you, the priest may pronounce you unclean. Anyway, that's another aside. But anyway, we're talking about the mouth, about blood guiltiness coming from the mouth. The mouth of the wicked, the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, for my love, they are my adversaries. With 20 years of laid down life, they're uttering charge and slander. Maliciously, viciously, sharp, like a sharp razor, like a sharp indictment. So they're rewarding me evil for good. And they're sending hatred for my love. Now this is what happens when you are guilty of blood. If you issue out blood guiltiness, you're accusing the other of evil that they have not done. Now if they, not only if they've not done evil to you, but on the contrary, even more so, if they have actually laid down their lives and been charitable towards you and served you righteously in the charity of God for many, many years, and now you're rewarding them hatred for all those years of love and service. This is Psalm 109. It's very severe. For my love, they're my adversaries. But I give myself unto prayer. They've rewarded me evil for good. They've rewarded me hatred for my love. Set a wicked man over him. Let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. And I'm not going to read it all, but it goes on and on and on and on and on. It's like we always say, does the fullness of all this always have to be manifested to to, to people, now you can you can you can you can see this come in degrees upon people, to a lesser degree, to a greater degree. I'm just saying, look at the severity of rewarding hatred for love, a blood guiltiness, with a sharp deceitful tongue. You don't want to go down the blood guiltiness path. That's what I'm saying. And I I don't want to emphasize all the terrible things here. You can go home and read Psalm 109. Because he remembered not to show mercy. But he persecuted the poor needy man that he might even slay the broken heart. As he loved cursing. As he loved to utter damnation and cursing. What have you. So let it come unto him. Remember what I'm saying all along? The wicked man has to watch it. He don't Because he'll fall by his own counsel. He'll lay wait for his own soul. Just let him go and give him enough rope as we heard preachers say. They'll hang themselves. They'll indict themselves. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothes himself with cursing, like as with a garment, let it come into his bowels like water. On and on you go. Let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord and of them that speak evil against my soul. Now that's a good distinction. Speak evil against the soul. And that goes on and on. I'm not going to read it all. Psalm 120, a song of degrees. In my distress I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with them that hated peace. You know, some people actually are not seeking peace. They are, they are deliberately embracing the provocation. They want a fight. Okay? I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for War. They want. They want the challenge. They want the knockdown, drag up. Well, I don't want any of that. I want peace. They can have their war. I don't want it. I will lift up mine eyes. Okay. And now this is. I was saying so many bad things. I better say something good. <laughs> because 
you know, if we want to keep ourselves in the love of God and keep ourselves pure, as, as we talk about all the time, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. I'm not going to lift it up to the pharmaceutical. I'm not going to lift it up to the legal profession. I'm not going to hope in lawyers and psychology counselors. I'm not going to trust in the almighty dollar. Uh, you know, I'm going to lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. And God be thanked, my foot wasn't moved. Although I wondered for about six months, but it wasn't. Was it? My foot wasn't moved. I'm still, I still, my foot is still able to take steps of faith. I'm still walking with God as you are. He'll not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. This is the man that makes God his trust, keeping himself from blood guiltiness. This is the confidence God will bring upon you. This is the confidence God brings upon me in times of visitation. As much as I'm able to keep myself from entering into my own works and taking my own vengeance, and as I ride this, ride this tightrope of trying to indict things according to my calling and what I'm given power and authority to indict, and yet not do it in such a way as to try to take vengeance myself upon that which I feel is personal offenses against me. And, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. But the sun shall not smite thee thy day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. This is the man who makes God his trust. This is the man who is keeping his heart with all diligence, no malice, no reviling, no vengeance. Now you can still be angry at the evil. Be angry and sin not. not. Get placed to the wrath. God will deal with it. God will deal with it. The only, the only times I get, uh, I approach being explicit about things is I'm, usually I'm just doing it in the hope of restoration. It's getting harder and harder to hope in restoration. But again, I'll say it one more time. These are the things that have to be acknowledged among some people to bring restoration. Uh, and recognizing these things for what they are as necessities, uh, I, I put it out there. Okay, so that is blood guiltiness, basically, is what I was saying, blood guiltiness. Keep back us from blood guiltiness, right? As David said, uh, yeah, deliver me from blood guiltiness. All right, praise the Lord. I'm done.